Um, now, Aviva, Ireland's largest insurer, is marking the 10-year anniversary of the official opening of the Aviva Stadium and its proud long-term sponsorship of the iconic venue. To celebrate this milestone, Aviva are paying tribute to some of the most iconic sporting moments of the last decade. Feel free to join in. You can follow Aviva Ireland on Instagram and Twitter and you can share your favourite Aviva Stadium memories using the hashtag safe to dream So um, we've been having different matches. Uh, match one yesterday was Shane Long against Germany up against the 2019 FAI Cup final. It was a bit of a landslide for Shane Long, as you would expect. So, uh, an amazing moment. Germany were the world champions. The whole town was absolutely on fire for the whole day, going, the world champions are coming to town today, and we're playing them football. And we're all a little bit concerned about what they might do to us. But uh, they didn't do anything to us. We beat them. Leo Messi in town was the second one yesterday, right? And it was uh, Messi comes to Dublin. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, well, that's obviously Leo Messi. He is a celebrity. He's going to win this. But no. He didn't win this. Kieran Kelly saves all four Rovers penalties. Rom Tome, 60-40 was the essentially figure. 59-41 is the, uh, if I'm being pedantic about it. But uh, four penalty saves in a row, a world record in a uh, Rovers versus Rovers, some Rovers on Rovers action as Sligo Rovers beat Shamrock Rovers in the penalty shootout in the Aviva all of 10 years ago. And uh, Kieran Kelly is actually the star of the show, right? Two and a half million views on YouTube. People have watched this. Kieran Kelly, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. Is it good afternoon, technically, where you are? Uh, it's uh, half ten, or, or just nearly twenty to eleven now at this stage. All right, uh, perfect. So still here in Qatar. Still the morning in Qatar. What are you doing in Qatar? Uh, I suppose still on this football journey. Um, it's taken me to the Middle East, so I'm just uh, having fun and and continuing uh, the football trade that, that we started off. You're a coach now, is that right? Yeah, so while I was playing, um, I kind of had a lot of uh, time in the afternoons because we were training full time. So look, looking to um, just get out into the local community in Sligo uh, and Mayo and just help kids. Uh, but I suppose with the challenge, it, it, it brought me to uh, do my UFB licence and, and did my UFA licence in, in 2015-16. So I suppose I wanted to explore that a little bit more and, and see where this can take me. Okay, that's really interesting because like the the, uh, the A licence is, is a long piece of work. It's not something you kind of do a night here, a night there, and six months later you're qualified. It's a proper significant investment in time and finances to, to actually get it. So you're kind of committed to being a, a coach if you want to if you actually want to do it properly and if you want to achieve through it, you, you have to go wholeheartedly into it. Yeah, I suppose I've been fortunate as well to be a part of um, such amazing squads and, and work with such good managers. Um, so picking up those uh, skill sets that, that they provided us uh, players was, was, I suppose I was fortunate enough as well, you know. And how did you end up in Qatar? Yeah, so the opportunity, I suppose, back in 2012, uh, while I finished my B licence, uh, I was looking at, you know, my next step. Uh, so the plan was to get the A licence by 2016 and, and to, to move abroad. So my now wife, uh, we decided in 2014 that we'd take the next step. So we, I suppose we was two years in the building um, and she moved here in 2016 and uh, I came out shortly afterwards. And did you have a job to come to when you got there? Did you know exactly yeah, where, so where I, you were going? Yeah, so I started with a football academy here. Um, it just gave me the time to, to network and, 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 and really, uh, you know, explore the, the Qatar Football uh, Association and the leagues there. Um, a guy called Keith Young, um, he had a club here. He was a founding member of the club. And I don't know if you're familiar with a guy called Stephen Goff. He would have played with Sherman Grovers, Longford, Bray. Uh, he was the assistant manager, so he, when we found we were working, or we were both working here, we, we connected fairly fairly quickly, you know. And um, am I right in saying that at that stage the club was kind of in one of the lower tiers? Yeah, so it was it was basically amateur turning uh, semi-professional in the third division. Um, so I suppose when I came on board, the challenge for me and, and, and really the goal was was to turn the team professional. Um, so fortunate enough, uh, that happened in, in uh, 20, early 2019. So we, we won the third division and there was a rigorous process uh, of 
probably in around six months. So August 2019, we got promoted to the QSL2. And we're on the verge of the whole club turning professional now where we'll have a professional academy under 19, under 17, under 15 and under 13 as well. So that's just around the corner. That's Hopefully fair. when COVID-19 uh, eases out and we can start the re-entry. So, and what, what is it actually like in Qatar? How, how strenuous has the lockdown been? Is it the same for you guys as it is for everywhere, everywhere else around Pretty the world? Pretty much the exact same. I'd say if anything, we're, we're probably a week ahead. So kind of March the 9th, the school's closed. Um, we've been in lockdown, you know, mass and, and are mandatory at the moment here in Qatar. Uh, we're just on, on the final part of Ramadan here. Um, so the QFA announced uh, just on Sunday there that, that teams can go back to training on June the 9th, but in small groups uh, of four to six players. And the, the, the league still has to finish here. So they're going to finish the league starting the 24th of July. Um, and it's going to finish in, in roughly three weeks. Right. Um, is the weather going to be OK for summer football? <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's 37 degrees at the minute here um, at, at quarter to 11 in the morning. So wow. it's it's quite warm. But I suppose uh, anyone that has visited the Middle East will, will know the facilities here are, are second to none. You've got air-conditioned stadiums where, you know, at pitch level, you know, it could be the showgrounds on, on a Saturday night. <laughs> That is that is pretty amazing, and obviously, like it's a, a very interesting time to be out there to see what's happening in preparation for the the World Cup. Was that kind of part of your thinking when you picked Qatar to move to that? Like, there's obviously going to be a huge investment in football anyway. There's always a plan, and I suppose uh, with with uh, the mentors that that uh, have been helping me throughout my coaching career and football career, uh, they had seen, uh, I suppose, the opportunity. Uh, from the announcement in 2011 that Qatar will host the 2022 World Cup. So, uh, yes, uh, Qatar World Cup 22 was was definitely a, a, in my mind at the time. What kind of a coach are you? You're not just a goalkeeper coach, or are you a goalkeeper coach specialising in goalkeeping? Or, like, what what is your ambition as a coach and, and philosophy? Yeah, so kind of at the moment, I'm kind of... Um, director of football, looking at the academy manager, director of football role, looking at the whole concept of, of the club, um, building a playing structure throughout all the academies. Um, I suppose I'm uh, one that's philosophical in relation to the technique, uh, uh, the tactical analysis, um, the physical uh, elements of the game, but most importantly, the social part of the game. Um, the social influence here is, is huge, the, the, the impact that we can have on players here. And, and I suppose I've been fortunate enough to work with managers that were very good dealing one-to-one -one and, and, and having those skills and, and obviously passing those skills that's on to me. It, just on the fact that the club can have a, a social impact, where, where are the kids coming from largely when it, when it comes to your academy that you're working with? Are they the local kids that have grown up in the area? Yeah. Yeah, so it's probably a ratio of probably uh, one local to four expats. Um, so lots of, of nationalities for all over the world. And I suppose that was a challenge, working with different cultures. Um, language as well. So I had to adapt as well, um, picking up different uh, parts of Spanish, Portuguese, and, and obviously Arabic as well. So um, I suppose this is the challenge that I wanted to, to, to test myself as well as a person, you know, and, and, and obviously second as a coach. It, it does football uh, fulfil the, the same sort of social role then in a place like Qatar as it would in Ireland or in, in the United Kingdom? Like, I mean, with the, the World Cup coming up, obviously in, in 2022, there's an opportunity here for the country to try and put forward a positive image around the world. But is there going to be something more meaningful than that? Is, is the investment in football going to uh, allow people to get more opportunities through football? 100%. You know, um, I suppose the, the the World Cup is going to be here for four weeks. Um, when Qatar was announced back in 2011, they've been building the whole country for these four weeks. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Gary Neville interview there at Christmas that was on Sky Sports, uh, his visit to Qatar. Um, you know, it's it's incredible the amount of work that's been done here in in I've been here three years and, and it, it feels like every time I, I, I drive on the highway, there's something new being built. You know, there's, there's hotels going up, 
in, in the space of a couple of weeks. And, um, but the long-term effect that the, the association are doing here as well, looking to, to drive football in communities, and that's something or the ethos of, of what Dole Pearl Academy and Lucille have, uh, have done as well, um, that we're connecting to schools and, and really using football as a tool um, to develop good people first. Uh, I know it's a cliche, um, but at the same time, it's important to have that mentality. It's been controversial with um, human rights questions about the building of the stadiums and stuff. How engaged do you need to be as somebody who lives there with those stories? Yeah, they're, they're, they're obviously going to have a, a lots of various opinions here. I, you know, it, it's, it's difficult because, you know, there's conditions of, of obviously today, uh, 37 degrees and, and the working conditions. I do know that they've changed a lot over, over the recent years and period. Uh, from originally back in 2011, 12, 13, um, a lot of structures have, have, have put, been put in place to make sure the health of, of work, the, the health of workers ha have increased. Um, but definitely for me, it, it's, you know, people talk about uh, Russia being a fantastic World Cup. I definitely think that 2022 is going to outshine them all. Definitely a story that we're going to continue to follow here. Let's talk about, um, it's 10 years ago. Can you believe it's 10 years ago, essentially, since the FAI Cup final in the Aviva Stadium? It, it, it doesn't feel like 10 years ago because uh, I suppose the memories are still fresh. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's, 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 it's been a, an amazing period in, 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 in probably Slug Rover's history um, that kind of... I suppose if, if, if I'm going to identify when did it all start, probably earlier parts of that year when we won the, the EA Sports Cup. Um, that gave us the confidence to believe we, we can push on and, and start winning major trophies. Um, and I suppose that was the start of, of our, I suppose, our history, of our period of, of 2010 to probably 2014. How much of the penalty shootout do you actually remember now? Uh, in detail, <laughs> yeah. So, kind of the effect of 2009 um, Cup final, the previous year when when uh, we were one 0 up with with probably six seven minutes to go, and, and uh, Alan Keane had a header back that I suppose I hesitated, and you know it was the decision that I kind of stole the as I I tripped him up, and Alan Kelly pointed to the spot. Uh, that penalty had a huge effect on me um, for a long period of time afterwards, and I suppose it took. It, there was a, a rebuilding stage there where, where probably only my family and friends know that history behind the scenes. Um, but definitely looking into 2010, I was a stronger person, um, and I suppose I used those strengths to, to I suppose, deal with the, the situation of the penalty shootout in 2010. Um, as soon as the final whistle went in extra time, I got off the pitch um, and I used that moment uh, to, to, I suppose, calm myself down um, and not get involved in the emotions of the whole occasion um, that was happening on the pitch. Because the crowd, I suppose, it was 30-odd, 6,000 or something. Um, it was a fantastic occasion for, for the League of Ireland itself. Um, and I think the FEI had huge credit, credit to, to play with that, you know, opening up the Aviva. Um, so yeah, so it was kind of interesting moments because I didn't speak to the players or I didn't speak to the manager, even though probably they made a few attempts. I was kind of shying away that, that I knew I had to be kind of zoned out and, and use that time to, to focus on the challenge, you know. I, I hadn't realised that the, the, the 09 had had such an impact on you. And in terms of becoming a better goalkeeper, like, was it a psychological impact? Oh, most definitely. Uh, probably, probably first I looked at it as a person. Um, that that, you know, I, I suppose I looked at everything that I was doing outside the game, um, training wise. You know, was there areas where I could improve personally, mentally as well? Um, because I suppose I wasn't able to deal with with the loss in the final and how I dealt with it. it probably wasn't the correct way. Um, but definitely the, those strengths that that are those techniques that I used in preparation for, for 2010 definitely helped me. And I suppose if you look at the penalty shootout, I, I was, I felt I was in control, even though, you know, should a goalkeeper be in control of a penalty shootout? You know, it's, it's, it's some people say it's a lottery and, and 
and I suppose the penalty taker is favourite. But I looked at it. I suppose I looked at it quite differently, and I felt that uh, you know it, it was it was it was something where where I, I believed in in what we were doing would would help us you know, succeed. As they're happening and as you're saving them, and if you save the first one and you save the second one, are you like something something special is happening here, or do they all are they actually all got to take each individual penalty on its merits? Uh, yeah, uh, it was one one penalty at a time. I, I think that's that's what I uh, you know I was trying to speak to myself. Uh, if I remember back, Owen Doyle took our first penalty, and I I was in the I was in the corner flag. I didn't look at our penalties. Um, for the main reason, I didn't want to emotionally get involved in the shootout. Um, so I remember I was just sipping on a bottle of water and and just focusing on a piece of ground or while our penalties were going in or not going in, as the case was, was <laughs> happened. Um, so every time I'd, I'd hear the reaction from the crowd, I just knew it was it was my turn to to to, to go in goal, and and I didn't really focus on the score. Um, I suppose when the Gary Twigg's first penalty, it was uh, just to my right hand side, and I just focused on his technique. The way his stance was, I knew he was tired, and I knew he'd go back to his safe, safe kick of opening his body up and, and just pushing it into the corner. And I was fortunate enough to guess the right way, you know. There's one. The, I think it's the third one. Comes straight at you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Chris Turner's penalty. I suppose it was. Uh, I'm, I'm going to cheat with that one. Uh, Chris Turner took a penalty in 2009 against uh, for Dundalk uh, in Oriel Park, and I remember at the time I went to my right hand side and he drilled it down the middle. And afterwards I was going. I kind of knew at the time that on my dive I've gone. He's going to drill it. So some strange. Um, Focus within me at that time said, "This is the same penalty, same technique. He's going to strike it." Um, so I, I don't know for I kind of held my position as long as I could, and if I had to go, I could still use my left leg uh, to to push off. But I kind of stayed and held my ground, and fortunate enough, it, it it worked out right in the end. That's the bravest save, is it, of the of the four? Because that's the one where you end up looking a bit foolish if he just slides it either side. But actually, the bravest thing to do is to stand there and wait and wait and wait. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. I suppose when you put it in those in, in that context, uh, I suppose the decision first and foremost, while he's on his run up, um, to, to to stay ground, stay set. Um, I suppose it was it was brave. Um, but I just, uh, I don't know. I was full of confidence from the first two penalties, and I felt that. Because I had such a clear mindset that I was able to make that decision, um, and I, I just felt time was so slow. Even on the the, the second penalty save, you know, I, I, do, I don't think I, I celebrated it. I was just like, I felt that I was in so much control at that moment in time. And and I think that the fourth penalty save, you can even see how confident I was that that I went so early. I, I'd made my mind up that that Paddy Kavanagh was going to my left hand side, and, and I went so early. I think it was on the ground when it hit me. Uh, and I felt, <laughs> I, I know it's probably a little bit cheeky, but I, 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 I was thinking about how we were going to celebrate uh, with the lads. So that's how confident I felt at that moment in time prior to the kick. 2.7 million views on YouTube. It's a, it's a fairly sensational thing, like a decade on to have saved four successive penalties in a penalty shootout. And they were like all on target. You know, it's not like there was three saves and one wide. It was like, they're all proper saves. Yeah, I suppose I could be in that situation only for the work of, of, of my teammates because, you know, at the same time, uh, they would have helped me out getting over probably the, the, the impact that 2009 had. Um, and I just felt that, that the work that we had put in behind the scenes, you know, penalty shootouts were a regular thing in, in Sly Grover's training sessions uh, at the end and, and everybody got involved in them. Uh, whether there were uh, cups of teas or cans of coke <laughs> on offer at the end, it, it was it was we all, always enjoyed it. You've beaten Leo Messi in the pole yesterday. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I woke up to I I, I didn't realise it. Uh, I woke up to a lot of uh, 
tweets this morning and, and private messages and, and, and I suppose it's 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 nice company to be in. Um but it, it obviously shows the the appreciation that, that the Irish people have for the League of Ireland and I think well hopefully in, in the next period of, of six to twelve months that, that the back and that the people will, will get behind the league. If if, from, if Lionel Messi were to take FBI. five consecutive penalties, how many of them would you save? He's the best player that ever played the game. He's obviously going to score three. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. That's not bad. Karen, you've been great with your time. Um, uh, enjoy whatever's coming next, and hopefully you get to uh, get back on the football field sooner rather than later. It sounds like it's a, it's a life less ordinary anyway. Thanks a million for joining us today, and congratulations on a great poll victory. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, OK? That's good stuff there. The um, polls continue today. So that's uh, Kieran Kelly saving four, all four Rovers penalties in the 2010 FAI Cup final shootout. Uh, the polls that are live now is Johnny Walters' goals against Bosnia versus Jack Charlton's homecoming. So the emotion of Jack Charlton's return versus the uh, sheer bloody mindedness and force of nature that was John Walters that night against Bosnia to qualify for the Euros. The quarterfinal this afternoon is going to be Shane Duffy against Denmark versus uh, Shawnee Maguire's goal against Dundalk. Um, like Shane Duffy's goal against Denmark is kind of a false dawn as well, so you'd think Shawnee Maguire has a good chance there for that one. And this is just a reminder of Eva Ireland's largest insurer is making, is, sorry, is marking the 10 year anniversary of the official opening of the Aviva Stadium and its proud long term sponsorship of the iconic venue. To celebrate this milestone, Aviva are paying tribute to some of the most iconic sporting moments of the past decade. Feel free to join in. You can follow Aviva Ireland on Instagram and Twitter and share your favourite Aviva Stadium memories using the hashtag SafeToDream. We're doing football this week, we'll do rugby next week.